Scuff YKK is a legendary New York City graffiti writer whose name is synonymous with graffiti's golden era. For the month of December, we teamed up with Scuff to produce a limited run of prints featuring an action sequence of his stamp-like throw-up that has been omnipresent throughout New York. Many of the prints are signed by Scuff and are on a first-come, first-served basis. The print is only available via our Patreon and will be shipped to all members, along with access to our episode library, interviews from Host18, Cash4, XSM, Les YKK, Sake, and Sean Crawford. Thank you, as always, to everybody who supports us. Next month, we're going to be running a second food drive in New York. Details on that on a later date. So, peace and love to everybody, and enjoy the episode. Okay. So, yo, th- thank you for coming on the show, Jedi yeah. Five. Thank you so um, much. Yeah, so I guess we were talking about the benefits that you have learned through writing graffiti that uh, maybe you can't take in directly uh when you're young but then as you grow older and you've been in the scene and you learn that everyone starts out as a toy you learn that everyone starts out pretty much sucking and that's Mm -hmm. pretty much a a thing in everything you always start out sucking whereas like in graph it's like really frowned upon to suck um whereas in other things it's more like or suck long term i think you're expected (laughs) to suck at the beginning exactly yeah 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 i don't know i think it just teaches you so many life lessons like in the fact that you could kind of just start like you said with nothing and then um uh, just teach yourself kind of how to like build this character, build this uh, persona, or um, just kind of level up yeah. in general. So when did you start uh, writing graffiti? Uh, 97, 98, what, around then, yeah. What, what made you uh, start writing? I think for the reasons that a lot of kids get into it, you know, like it was just something that I was attracted to. Other kids in high school were doing it, um, and I just wanted to kind of be a part of that. I wanted to be a part of something. You know, so I kind of just gravitated it, gravitated to it, excuse me, um, just to kind of uh, maybe even just fit in with my peers. Yeah. And then once I really got um, submerged into the whole, the mystique of it all, it just kind of, it just captivated me so much, you know. I couldn't wrap my head around how there would be someone who would be up in, let's say, Brooklyn, Queens, and the Bronx, and then they were also painting with so-and-so and so-and-so. I couldn't wrap my head around it. You know, it was just like... The mystique of that all just just captivated me totally. What was your life like? Before, what were you into before you started writing? Uh, definitely like a lot of sports, like a lot of just generic, you know, basketball, baseball, mm-hmm. you know, just sports nerd kind of stuff. So what, why do you think it like, I don't know, I feel like a lot of the times people who get into graph, they're into like other maybe similar things. Like I know a lot of skateboarders eventually get into graph or people who, you know, like in the past, like b- b-boy culture, they would get into graph or vice versa. You yeah, know. I think it kind of just um, the desire to latch on to, to something, to latch on, to be accepted by a group of people. Mm-hmm. You know, I think you could just be an, an adolescent. You're either insecure about various things or you're maybe if your household is the kind of place that you don't really want to be in, you want to like kind of just sneak out at night and whatnot and paint. Yeah. Um, it was just a bit of an escape and I you think know, like in a lot of ways. Growing up in Brooklyn, too, I think that's like a that's a very good place to get a feel for what's going on in terms of graffiti you know what i mean like a lot of like because i'm from brooklyn too and Mm -hmm. thinking of like the the writers that have come out of there um it's especially the generation that you come from you know what i mean it's like it's like the the prime you know what i mean like i take a lot of pride in like south brooklyn kind of graffiti-ish styles and like you were it you know what i mean you well, were like the in that era you know what i mean i just missed it by like a few years couple of years yeah, yeah. <laughs> well i mean but it depends when you came up if you were coming up in the 80s you would think mm-hmm. that was like you true. know the golden age you That's know true. Yeah. but um i i do feel fortunate that i at least got to before the buff came really strong in like the early 2000s that i really got to see um even older graffiti on the walls you know dating back to yeah. you know late 80s early 90s that kind of stuff was still yeah. um influencing me as i was as i was coming up so. dude you know what i was thinking about in terms of the buff like mm-hmm. um a lot of the train because they remodel they redid the train stations in um in brooklyn mm-hmm. they spent like nine billion dollars like uh re- resurfacing all the stuff and like for example the end line okay. like when you would stand on the platforms you would see like the catwalks on top covered with like graffiti from like the 70s and 80s and 90s right and now since they like painted it all mm-hmm. it's like it kind of takes away it's like they killed a big chunk of that graffiti that i looked up to as a kid and you know it's 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 it truly the buff can truly change things it's sad to say but yeah certainly yeah i mean uh yeah a lot of that a lot of that mystique of it just washed away you know in that but that's part of it though you know like right now the buff isn't as heavy and i hear 
people complaining about that in mm -hmm. a way. It's just because like they don't have any. So it's like this is a part. This is like an ongoing cycle. A lot of people like to say like uh, that like you die and graffiti doesn't, but graffiti dies quicker than you do. You just do four million of them. Yeah, well, but I, I personally have tried at least to like seek out unique places where I think it, the graffiti can last decades, if not even uh, longer than that. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, not even just in exploring the subway tunnels in New York, but just various other like kind of municipal structures that would have no reason to get cleaned or no reason to get kind of torn down. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're painting like um, like a rooftop or whatnot, you know, I mean, New York City is just always changing. It's always in flux. Mm -hmm. So there's the potential that that building is just going to get demolished regardless. But I do think there's a way if you do enough research and you really kind of know where to snoop around that you can find places that, I mean, you know, will stand the test of time to some degree, however, however you define that. Mm -hmm. So when you started writing Graph, you know, you had this like, what was your, what was like the purpose of it? What was a... Uh, do you know why you started writing aside from just like finding an escape and then having carried on for so many years and you know you're still doing stuff I'm assuming that the reasoning for doing it has changed oh yeah definitely I mean um, I think when I was younger it's like an ego thing like I saying like I was saying you're trying to like assert yourself amongst your peers and now I just do it when there's a place that really strikes me as either having like an interesting kind of historical element to it or I think it could really be a you know a permanent spot in one way or another um so i'm not really looking to do stuff even that the general public's going to see or other writers are going to see i'm trying to just do research on places that are interesting for me from like a, for me from like a historical perspective almost mm -hmm. and go to paint there so that's a quite a big contrast from you know when i was 17 oh, yeah. 18 years old trying to do a fill-in wherever so that some someone in you know my high school would see it it's interesting though because you said earlier that uh, one of the reasons you you did it was to like you know find an escape mm -hmm. and i hear that a lot you know like that's like a, co a common one like people mm -hmm. uh, young people trying to find an escape like an escape from what isn't it sad or maybe not sad but isn't it at least interesting that mm -hmm. like so many young people feel like they have to like escape from some yes yeah, escape what you know yeah, yeah exactly yeah. but i mean i think for a lot of graffiti artists it can come back to like a home life kind of thing and wanting to escape that and kind of just um feel accepted by maybe you know your, your peers for a variety of different reasons so yeah. do you feel like you needed to escape your home life yeah yeah that's that's partially why i was like sneaking out at three in the morning to to do graffiti you yeah know? yeah for, for me um i feel like graffiti was one of those things like when, when i started writing that it was just like in a way like maybe back then i didn't realize it but now like analyzing it further mm -hmm. it kind of is like an escape because uh Maybe not an escape from my home life in the sense where, like, I'm trying to escape a tragic place because my home life was not tragic. Uh, like, you know, have a good family and et cetera, et cetera. But, like, the fact that I do come from a good family or, or had, like, a stable house kind of pissed me off. Because I'm mm. like, damn, all these cool fucking, like, all this cool music talks about having, like, an unstable house uh, with unstable parents. All this, uh, all, the, like, the cool kids or whatever have have the opposite. So, like... I want to deviate from that and I will do so by, let's say, like... Doing something rebellious. Doing, or... yeah. And, like, you know, graph is one of those things. You know what I mean? Totally, yeah. Um, yeah, but we're, what what would be, like, a healthy balance? I don't know. You yeah. know, a healthy balance between those things, like, uh, in terms of home life or... Um, yeah. I just feel like when you get older, um, maybe the reasons for graffiti change. Like an escape, for example, when you're older is from like your parents or like, you know, like little rules. But as you get older, I feel um, maybe the structure society puts on like your daily routine and like what you're supposed to be doing. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like going out at 3 a.m. and like being in your own world and like creating something that's like so unique and like nobody's doing that around you. Everyone's sleeping. It's like a true escape from the structure society has placed on you because like you're a complete outlaw in a way because you're like abnormal. Yeah, like a lot of times I'll be in a place where it's just secluded from the rest of society. Yeah. It's like three in the morning, either if it's in the tunnels or it's on some tr a track side or something. And you can kind of, you know, society is existing in the distance. You can see cars going by, hear noises, but you're not partaking in that. And um, that's always just like a very kind of unique feeling. Yeah. But I would even say like, you know, we're talking about an escape and whatnot. Um, it has now even kind of with with travel, you know, gr graffiti traveling to do graffiti is is a uh, like a real positive element of that of that escape, you know, just to be able to go all around the world and paint graffiti and and meet writers from other places and kind of get their perspective on life or 
or on graffiti or get like a, a tour of their city that you wouldn't necessarily uh, get the right, you know, that perspective on just as a, like a regular tourist, yeah. you know, so. Uh, yeah, especially graffiti writers, they wouldn't just give you like the regular tourism. They would <laughs> show you like the, the deep catacombs of Paris or like some crazy stuff that normal people don't get to see, you know what I mean? Yeah, like um, maybe two years ago, um, the woman I was dating, her and I, we went to, um, to Morocco, to Tangier, and we linked up with like the only two writers who were there, and we went to just these, these slums in Morocco, like some place that would not be on the, <laughs> yeah. the tourist map, you know? And they, they just took us down there to paint and whatnot in like these abandoned uh, canals. Mm -hmm. And um, just like a, just a really unique experience, you know, and they took us like local restaurants and whatnot, so. Um, yeah, you definitely yeah. have a, a, like a different life experience than the majority of people. And one, one of the things that I thought of is like, um, there's this one interview of you, or it's like a story written on you about like, um, and part of it is talking about graffiti as an addiction. And the fact that like you did like you went to like an addiction counselor or something like that to try to oh no i was just speaking to a a, a shrink who happened to be an addiction oh, okay like for you know for uh, an addiction specialist but i didn't go you didn't go like, for graffiti. no i was just talking you know oh, okay okay but yeah, yeah. just in, ter in terms in general like um graffiti as an addiction do you think that's true do you think that there was a point in your life where you started to realize like yo i'm legitimately writing this a million times yeah i mean i think in the in the, the formative years i, I had an addiction like a, a a need to go out and do it um maybe not a compulsion to do it i wasn't always someone like taking marker tags everywhere to, but definitely an obsession you know to and my mind was always just kind of focused on that especially focused on like particular spots and whatnot and do you, st do you still feel as driven um definitely not no yeah. okay yeah yeah because because yo i'm like sometimes i don't understand how people can still be hyped on it and there are people who stay you know just as hyped as when they started which is like that means they probably love it more or maybe their mind works differently or but i feel like me as well as a lot of my friends and the mm -hmm. people who i've met like as even people who like are serious like pretty much serious bombers and you know are pretty up and stuff they like even i hear it from them like i'm getting i'm getting like it's getting old i'm getting over it which uh which like then when i meet someone like you or someone who's been painting for so long you know it brings me to question like do you still feel as hype do you still I certainly don't get the same rush out of it that I do when I was younger, um, and I certainly don't do it as much as, as I used to, but um, it's kind of just there, you know, and now I'm, I, it's, it's not my only focus or my only interest. I have a wide variety of interests, so I'm able to pursue all sorts of other things, and then graffiti is just like kind of there when I'm able to do it. Yeah. When's the last time you've been chased? Um, like uh, last winter, a bunch of workers chasing me out of the tunnels. So like when you yeah. get chased, do you still mm -hmm. feel uh, that fear? Or I feel that... like an old man who's out of breath. Yeah. Is how I feel. Yeah. But do you, in terms of your emotions, do you feel any type of fear when it's happening? Or are you so over it and used to it that this is like nothing? Well, it depends. I mean, um, it depends who's chasing you, I guess, or where you're being chased. If, if I'm in, if I, this particular place was like really, really deep in a subway tunnel, so to have to run, I don't know what it was, you know, seven, eight, nine city blocks out of the tunnel with getting chased by the workers and whatnot. Um, that's just a headache. You have all these things going through your head. What the fuck am I still doing at this age? You know, mm -hmm. going to these places. Um, but I mean, if I got chased maybe out of like a freight yard or something, I don't think it would be as uh, as uh, intense just because the environment might not necessarily be as uh, stressful. Yeah. When, when did you go from uh, painting, you know, a lot of streets to painting more secluded areas or f searching out those spots that you speak of that are going to outlive the buff? I think I was always kind of into that, like in one way or another, even though uh, maybe at the, so in the early years, like early 2000s, yeah, I was doing streets and whatnot, but then um, maybe like by 2003, 2004, I started just kind of seeking out these more off the beaten path, path places all around the city. Mm -hmm. well, what would you say some of the, like the craziest uh, differences that you see, the key differences in between the era that you came up in, even just outside of graffiti, but graffiti included, to now when we're living in the cell phone era, the robot, pretty much the robot era? Um, well, right now I'm like thoroughly blown away by the magnitude of graffiti that some young people are painting, you know? Um, like there's some guy, like this guy Anso, like mm. I can't really wrap my head around how someone's writing that much. Um, but in terms of like the landscape, uh, I can't, I wouldn't really be able to pinpoint, other than the fact that, well, 
I think writers from when I was coming up had, like I said, the buff had been less strong, so there was a lot more influence from older graffiti. There was a lot more to draw from and, and take away from. The buff was less strong back then? Less strong back then, you know, in, in 98, 99, when I was just starting, you know, with graffiti. So um, to be able to really kind of absorb graffiti from 1990, 91, 92, to soak that up, I think, had an influence on writers from that era's style mm -hmm. and their, their perception or their perspective. Mm -hmm. As compared to now, like I would personally, I see that not people from that era aren't as active mm -hmm. anymore. You know what I mean? So like, there's not much going on in uh, certain neighborhoods where, let's say, had a strong foundation of graffiti and like very skillful graffiti writers. So maybe like, as a kid growing up, like now, I would I wouldn't have that much motivation because no one's really doing anything. I would look at it in terms of that way. You know what I mean? Yeah, but I would also I would kind of say like nowadays you have people really pushing the envelope in terms of not only in terms of the spots but like the, the magnitude, the size of the stuff they're painting. I mean, there's people doing all these really insane like roller spots and whatnot, um, and I don't think people were really pushing the envelope. I mean, they weren't back then. So it's a little bit of both, you know? Yeah. Positives and negatives. What do you say? What What do you think technology has? What has technology played a role in in a uh in the evolution of that to the point where now there's, like you said, rollers and people just painting as much as they are because now, even though people like Anso are like, aren't really on Instagram like that, mm -hmm. there is a, a sort of instant gratification that comes with uh, having your own little graffiti Instagram account where you can post it or even if you don't, mm -hmm. um, seeing it posted by all these photographers that, you know, document the graffiti that goes down, particularly in New York. Yeah, I mean, there's got to be people who are just painting graffiti for Instagram or for that kind of notoriety. Um, I would also just say that there's a bit of like maybe a homogenized internet style mm. where um, that's I'm not even talking about New York City. I'm just talking about globally. Like um, sometimes you can't necessarily tell where someone's from or where their influence is coming from, other than it might be just coming from the internet. Um, so that's definitely something that I think is uh, affecting contemporary writers a lot more than people from my my era do you think it's the, the internet and technology and instagram and all that is good or bad for a graph i think the internet is kind of just like it's like a yin and yang thing i think it can provide good and bad mm. things so um i mean it's i mean i was just mentioning how i went to morocco and i was able to paint with these other writers that never would have happened 25 years ago that was because of the internet um conversely you know maybe people aren't really cutting their teeth or learning the 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 tricks of the trade um, the way that they would have in years past. Do you think that surveillance uh, as part of technology is uh, curbing curbing people writing? And also, do you think it's curbing crime in general? Because I guess that's kind of one of the points of it, is to curb crime in general, and graffiti is included in that. But even aside from that, like you see all these, you see literal videos of assassinations in mm -hmm. New York. Um, you see them everywhere, but just since you know we're talking about New York, you see videos of literal assassinations planned assassinations in New York and uh, clearly the surveillance didn't stop that shit and I heard uh, some writer the other day say like all that all that facial recognition shit goes away when and they just put on like a surgical mask mm -hmm. um, which is true I mean for now it's true all the fa you can kind of see what someone looks like but it's pretty much gone like unless you already knew what they look like you're not going to know who they are when you randomly see them um, so where do you think that surveillance plays a part in our society today? Well, first and foremost, I would just say I think it's a negative thing how much surveillance that there is. But, um, there, I mean, right now, statistically, crime is, is on the uptick from years past, but not, you know, statistically from the 80s or the early 90s. So um, I, I, don't, I don't really know. I don't really know enough st statistically to, to answer the question. Yeah. Well, why, why do you think, though, that uh, the more surveillance is a bad thing? It just it just doesn't feel right, you know. It just feel it has like an unnatural kind of quality to it. Yeah. To have um, either through like you're saying facial recognition, or just um, having your Google, you yeah. know, whatever. Spy or even upon. like the fact that people put tape over their like laptop mm -hmm. cameras and stuff like that, like that already shows that you know, you know like uh, obviously you're not on a video chat at the moment, but just to know that it is a fact, they can activate that stuff without you knowing is like, oh, like this is uncomfortable. That's what I'm, you know what I mean? And like cameras on the streets, like every building has, you walk down a block, you're on footage like 50 times without knowing it, you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, it's just really unsettling. And at the same time, I don't really know what we can, we can do about it at this point, yeah. you know?
Yeah, and I mean, it seems like there's nothing we can do about it, but the question is, like, so I guess in theory, um, surveillance is there, one of the reasons, to curb crime, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And I guess in theory, like, the more surveillance there is, the more crime they can curb because people are less likely to do shit if there's literal video evidence of them doing shit. Uh, like there are there are writers who even just in graph mm-hmm. um, who see who see a gate and if it has that camera oh, with camera. the flashing red shit they're going to a new gate they won't hit it yeah yeah so then the question is like for society as a whole where we live in a society where there all where there are maniacs uh, who are smoking people left and right for literally no reason besides like they're in their mind like something isn't right um, and if like surveillance can curb it. Now the question is, and I'm not saying I agree with this, I'm just playing devil's, yeah. devil's advocate. Why not have more if this can potentially save someone from getting axed at an ATM thing? You know what I mean? Yeah. It just it just feels just too intrusive on people's lives in general. And I mean, there is a uh, decline in crime like over the centuries. It's just less, we're living in a less violent world than people were living in like 100 years ago, 200 years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. I, I don't think that we need to have our lives like uh, just uh, we don't have a big brother, if you will, kind of just looking at over us. Yeah, it was funny because today I uh, was at mm-hmm. uh, 34th Street Herald, Herald Square, mm-hmm. and there were cameras everywhere. Or? Yo, I was going into like you know where you where you where you uh, swipe your car, whatever, going to the turnstile, mm-hmm. and for each under each like you know a turnstile kind of has its own little booth, each turnstile, mm-hmm. and for each one there was two of those cameras, like two globes, for, two, of, two globes mm-hmm. for each turnstile, and I'm like. This is ridiculous because what the fuck do you, what are you going to do? Catch someone hopping? Mm-hmm. Like two cameras? Where are they pointing? I don't know, but like I'm assuming that it's something to do with the fucking turnstile seeing as they're right above it. And it just made no sense. Like I was looking at it and I kind of wanted to take a picture of it. But uh, yeah, no, that's crazy. But you talk about like um, how 100, 200 years ago we had like a more violent society i mean society has just been on a decline in terms of violence over just over in general the decades centuries i think there was uh, there was like an uptick i read a book about this it was like angels something angels anyhow um there was an uptick in the 1970s over the last uh 100 120 years but other than that crime has been on the decline um, and, statistically and that means a lot in the western world at least. that means a lot because uh Crime has been on the cl- on the decline. Violent crime has been mm-hmm. on the decline for we said 100, 200 years, mm-hmm. maybe more. But uh, population has been increasing, mm-hmm. which means it's even like crazier. And also, we've been living even more close together, where we're more likely to attack each other. We just lose our minds, yeah. And yet, it's still in general declining. But then you look at the world today, and you look at like what we see, and uh, how maybe you f- maybe if you take the train, like you might feel unsettled. Or uh, just walking down the street, like I'm always fucking looking behind my back when I'm walking down the street. Like there is no more than like 15 legitimate seconds where mm-hmm. I haven't seen like who's behind me because I literally am afraid always... that someone's gonna come up behind me and snuff me. Or at worse, because I just seen it. Like I saw one video on the New York Post, and I'm like, now I have to fucking forever be checking. And um, but long story short is like, it seems like when we read the news and also just like maybe the news is affecting my subconscious but when I mm-hmm. go out that we're living in a fucking crazy era it seems like um, this- and I would I would I would disagree I would say yeah. I mean, we're living in a crazy world certainly for a mm-hmm. variety of different reasons but um, I would, in terms of danger or personal safety I certainly don't feel that that how I might have felt when I was younger really so yeah maybe it's just a matter of perspective yeah, matter yeah. Of age you know how did you feel when you were younger uh, that it was just, I just think, I mean, while I have seen significantly more homeless people recently, there was just so many more homeless people. You would just see burnt out, uh, just blocks kind of in certain neighborhoods in Brooklyn. I remember going to like lumber yards or whatnot with my father in like Bushwick, Williamsburg in the, maybe in 1990. And the whole thing was just like totally burnt out, you know? So, um. So to you, this is peace. I mean, I wouldn't say peace. I, I think that's like a, a little extreme. Yeah. But I would. I don't feel like New York's like a dangerous place. But I think it's as dangerous as like Provo, Utah, right now, statistically. So, or Honolulu. Like it's not like dangerous in terms of um, an American city by any any standard. You know. Yeah, that's fucking crazy. Because uh, you know, I mean, I I pretty much agree with you. But it's just maybe it's because I've seen too much shit on the news. Mm. But like it doesn't. F- when I'm on the train, I'm like seriously ready to fight for my life ferociously with like all of my fury. Like I'm, I'll be on the train and I'll just like see what I saw yesterday on the on the metro, the Daily Metro of New York Post. Okay, yep. And I'm like, yo, at any moment, 
some kid can come and slash me in my eyeball for a gang initiation. And I, and I feel like, uh, I don't know, it's crazy to, to put it in that perspective because, I mean, statistically, you probably are right. But I guess maybe one of the things it is is like now because a lot of the attacks maybe back then like they maybe had more of a purpose mm -hmm. like oh like they were literally robbing me like we were talking to dude yesterday about like how in that era there was a bunch of stick-up kids that was a common thing um and you would hear about it in some of the songs like i said like stick-up kids they run upon us and like now maybe there's not as many stick-up kids but what there are is like people who will just attack you for absolutely no reason which in my mind makes me feel more in danger because whereas a stick-up kid I can wear nothing mm -hmm. and I'll be like pretty much safe because I'm not like fly or anything on the train to a maniac who's gonna snuff me for absolutely no reason when I don't see it coming I can pretty much not prepare for that yeah well so, I mean I was I'll I'll say that I was attacked by like a schizophrenic person I think in 2011 or 12 on the subway uh, right when I was getting off the train actually he attacked me from behind and uh but at the same time, even just with that story, I, I, I still don't feel like the subway is like a, a dangerous place. I mean, if you look, what well, I think it was 1987, 86, is Bernard Goetz. I don't know if you're familiar with Bernie Goetz, but he, he um, was a guy who was just consistently getting robbed on the subway. And he said, the next time I get, if someone attempts to rob me on the subway, I'm going to pull out a gun and shoot them. So we shot, I think, four or five kids from the Bronx who, uh, who approached him. And um, he ended up doing, like, he escaped. He ran into the tunnel, actually. He pulled the emergency brake, escaped into the tunnel. And, um, and then he, I think he just did, like, a year or two in jail for an illegal firearm. But he never got in trouble for actually shooting these kids. And he was a white guy, and they were all black teenagers. So it had, like, this whole, like, racial element. It was a really famous case. You could look it up, you know? Wow, and then he that. went on yeah. to own an electronics store in the city called uh, Vigilante Electronics. Wow. So by 14th Street, so go for here. Yeah, but he's a, yeah. So what happened when you got attacked on the train by a schizophrenic from behind? So I was looking in the tunnels, just looking at the graffiti. In fact, the train stopped by like an old feeling of mine on the F line. So I was looking in the tunnels and there was uh, this guy, he was reading like, it must have been like a remedial math textbook or something. I don't know what he was studying, but he thought I was like grilling him. But really I was looking past him. I was looking... Um, into the tunnel and then I even took out a camera and I tried to take a photo um, not with my not with my phone but with an actual camera of the, the tunnel he must have thought maybe I was taking a photo of him I don't know but like I said, he's a paranoid guy and when I left the train I went upstairs he must have followed me off the train and he just attacked me from behind and luckily you know I wasn't severely injured but um, it was a crazy moment you know wow what was the attack like he just pitched you he just threw me from behind and he was standing over me you know telling me something like uh you know, don't ever try to play me for a sucker or something. I mean, he was, he was out of his mind, you know? Yeah. The guy was out of his mind. But I had, like, a fractured uh, wrist or something, but it, it wasn't particularly bad. I could still paint even. Oh, so. shit, wow. In fact, uh, my buddy uh, Curve and I, we did, like, this big mural the next day out in Coney Island, so, you know. That is crazy. Yeah. So, you, you, for the most part, though, you think that the MTA is uh, safe? Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, you read studies, is. people it are is. nervous on the subway. Yeah. I get it. But um, I think, by and large, it's not, like... You know, I mean, I take the train four times every day and I haven't been attacked yet or seen anyone get randomly attacked. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the media makes a good point to really um, emphasize these these terrible things to instill that. Yeah, mm -hmm. for yeah, sure. Because I remember um, I did take the train for like a month or two and I was literally on the platform waiting for the train. And my friend sent me a video of like some random dude like um just randomly stabbing people on the train like he didn't care how old they were yeah. who Horrible. they were Insane. like anything yeah. and i'm waiting and the Broad trains are like and the trains approaching and i'm like i haven't been on this thing in a month bro this is like i'm gonna get on and mm -hmm. right away this i'm gonna, gonna get happen. stabbed and i'm sitting there like with my book bag on my lap like fucking ready to use it as a shield and i'm like yo this is this sucks. well i do think know? that there might be like more schizophrenic people just walking around mm -hmm. the city than in years past. Do you think it has to do with like the current state of things like mental health and all yeah, that stuff? Yeah, I think stuff? people's mental health in our society is just, it's just a mess, you know, in terms of either diagnosis or, you know, people not, people who are supposed to be on medication. There's a guy in my neighborhood, he's like absolutely out of his mind. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you see him and he's more or less normal, he must be taking his medicine. But I mean, he, he, uh, he attacks people all the time. I saw him spit on someone in broad daylight, like really disgusting, so. Yeah, I've noticed a lot more people kind of just bugging out on the streets, like definitely mm -hmm. not being mentally healthy you know and like i i work in the projects a lot and uh i remember last year um some dude in broad daylight jumped off the roof uh, um 
onto our like construction site and died like killed himself mm -hmm. and like it was just the craziest thing and like apparently he escaped from like he was fresh out of like a mental hospital and like i don't know it was just these things are really happening you know and uh i wonder if like we're talking about the current state of things you know like little little like what is it like death by a thousand cuts you know like little things here little mm -hmm. things there and and it, like, all it just seems like lost your there's mind. a lot of pressure right now mm -hmm. on people in general you know certainly yeah I don't, and I don't really know what can be done to, to fix to that. To kind of curb that, yeah. Because it's kind of like just like deeply ingrained in our system. Like uh, it's, it's, it's hard, especially in New York, to um, pay rent. It's hard to, you know, survive after the taxes. It's uh, hard to be close to anywhere where you work. Like the, it's like everyone I know has like an hour plus commute, pretty mm -hmm. much an hour commute. Um, very few people don't. Um, the people who don't have an hour commute have uh, pretty like lucky situations where they have where they live right where they you know or they pay astronomical amount for rent mm -hmm. and um, all of that you know I, I read this book uh, once called the blue zones of happiness I okay. believe and um, it talked about like the happiest places and it also talked about what those places had in common okay. and um, what were some of the happiest places uh, one of them was I believe uh, one of them was in New York, but it's like upstate okay, yeah, somewhere. Okay, yeah, not New York City. Yeah, no. And then um, I believe another one was like somewhere in Japan. One of them was in Canada. Okay. But um, were there just really good social services there? Is that it? Or men well, like w they had like factors that that made people who lived there happier. So one of them was uh, they I think I believe it was they socialized for at least six hours a day. Okay, yeah, right there, yeah. But and then another one was uh, their commute was less than fifteen minutes. So first of all, those two things, it's how the fuck are you supposed to socialize for six hours a day if you work a regular job, like a regular nine to five? In the morning, you're going to work, so then mm -hmm. that's done. You get out at five, let's say you socialize for six hours, assuming you don't do anything else from five to six p.m., assuming there's no commute, now it's 11 p.m., uh, I don't know, there's, the time isn't there. But then for some reason in these societies, whether it be for like their traditions or their religious mm -hmm. backgrounds or whatever, yeah. like they made it happen. They made it happen and they socialized and they were that much better. That off. much happier. Yeah. And I then, mean, anxiety, depression, these yeah. things just plummet when you have other people around you. And then the commute also. Mm -hmm. how the f who in New York only has a 15 minute commute? Very, oh. very few people. Uh, and compared to how if many people. you have people, a job, yeah. Compared to how many people live here, like they, they don't. Yeah. yeah, that's true. And like right now, like traffic is inevitable anywhere you go in mm -hmm. the city if you're driving and like i'm sure that takes a toll on people too you know like Just every single day yeah. being like yo again like again and again and like i gotta sit in this for like two hours like it's I yeah know. i think a lot of people are just kind of hanging on by a thread and then mm. just one thing or another happens you know and yeah. and, and that's it yeah how do, how do you feel uh, living in new york do you think that new york is a good place to live do i think that's a great question um as a lifelong new yorker as much as I fantasize about leaving the city and as much as I'm always on like Zillow looking at other places or I try to travel and just get different perspectives, man, I mean, sometimes just the opportunities that come your way in, in New York, outside of graffiti even, just like professionally or the people you meet, it's like, or the, the kind of restaurants you can even eat at, I'm just like, wow, I, this wouldn't be happening anywhere else but New York City. At least mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't think so. Or in this vo at this volume, yeah. you know? So, um... But do I think it's a good place to live? For some people, yeah. If you can make it, if you can make it work, if you can hustle, if you can figure it out, you know. Yeah, for for you, definitely yes. I feel like I'm just such a tried and true New Yorker. Even though I, like I said, I've had this lifelong fantasy of living in all these other places, and I've I tried living outside of New York City briefly. I lived in California for like six, seven months. Um, I spent a little bit of time in New Zealand, but. All in all, I just always find myself uh, coming back uh, to New York City. Do, do you think it's a Do you think it's a physically beautiful place? Like, do you think, for example, one would go to Paris and see the river and then see all the beautiful architecture that was literally like made to look beautiful, um, and then one would say, "Okay, this is a beautiful place." Now, do you look at New York and think the same, or? Um, I think on like a beautiful spring or summer day, maybe it can have that that quality to it, depending yeah. on where you are. But I wouldn't say it has like the same the same beauty, the same mystique as those other places you just mentioned. Yeah. You know? I find certain aesthetics like beautiful in like my neighborhood, for example. Like I remember the other day because um, I'm always in a rush and I would just like always ride my, my bike to the gym or whatever, for example. 
but then I had like extra time that morning and I mm. like took the I walked like the long way there and like the long way home and then like hopped on the train and like I was just like, yo this place is pretty sick like it has like little pockets of like originality and like certain life even though like most people wouldn't see it that live there but I just try to look at it from a different lens and little things were like, yo, this is so cool that like this has been that way for so long. Yeah, I mean, there is like fascinating architecture all around New York City. I, but I don't know if, if I feel the beauty of New York always when I'm walking around it. Sometimes I'm just a curmudgeon, you know, uh, New Yorker. Yeah. So have you ever thought about actually leaving? Yeah, I mean, like I said, I'm always looking at different places and whatnot. <coughs> and, um, um, like I said, I tried living for a little bit out in, out in California, out on the West Coast. But um, I don't know, in terms of just so many different business things that have going on here, or just different people I know here, I see myself being here for at least uh, the next few years, God yeah. willing. So. so are you the kind of person who needs, who would like to live in a city? Oh, yeah. Yeah, like I need hustle and bustle. Like um, I have a real difficult time at 3 in the morning in the suburbs or even just, you know, half an hour 45 minutes outside of the city at two in the morning with the crickets and whatnot i'll just have a really difficult time with that really yeah yeah because me and him are like a little bit i mean like, like to I, go camping and stuff and kind of just i've like, recently been adapting more mm -hmm. um just and like forcing myself through straight up like meditative brainwashing okay to to enjoy uh parts of my day that i considered before unenjoyable but um, every every like few months, I like have to go to like straight up essentially what people who are from New York would call the middle of the woods, because mm -hmm. um, like I really like feel like I'm like going insane type shit. Like I'll leave my house and it'll be I'll have to like watch where I'm walking because of how many people are on the sidewalk, and then I'll be like, yo, I need to, you know what I mean? You just need that that escape. If yeah, you know, but you know. lately I've been like completely in in you know enjoying it and having a really good time here. But it's always interesting to hear the different perspectives of people who come on the show and we talk, like all of them pretty much live in New York mm -hmm. and uh, what they think about it and how their experience has been here. Some of them moved here. Some of them have been living here forever. Um, and it's just interesting because I, I hear like all, all over all the different board. perspectives. Because or... it's crazy though. Like for example, anywhere else for the most part, if you're going to drive, let's say, what is it, five to seven miles, mm -hmm. that's like a fucking... I don't know, 10 minutes, like seven minute yeah, drive. Yeah, took me an hour and a half to get here from yeah. Brooklyn. Yeah. And then when you get there, meaning anywhere else, mm -hmm. you're going to find parking. Mm -hmm. You're going to, you're right away. Uh, there's pretty much, and if you have to look for five minutes, that was like too long. Yeah, that was like yeah. forever, yeah. And then here, it's like a fucking shit show to get somewhere. And then um, then to find parking, like it's a whole nother, that's a whole nother commute, finding the parking, depending on what area you're in. Um it's just crazy. What do you think about uh, all the cars in New York? Um, well, I'm part of the problem because I just got a car in the last year. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, so I, I have no point of reference, really. I never drove before having this car, so um, I wouldn't know. But people are saying that the, the traffic is even crazier than ever in the past year, year and a half. You know, mm -hmm. there's more and more cars on the road. So, um, um, but I, I, I'm part of that problem. So Yeah, and yeah. parking, too, has, like, increasingly gone up, like, I remember like a few years ago, if you get in my neighborhood, mm -hmm. if you got to, tr if you got home and you try to look for parking after 5 p.m., it was like very difficult. You would, a lot of people sl sleep in their cars, I had to do that one stuff time, like yeah. that. But now like, it seems like <laughs> on a weekday mm -hmm. after like 2 p.m., yo, there's no space on like fire hydrants, like everyone's sleeping in their cars or like, I don't know, parking like on a 45 degree angle, just saying just fuck, get, it. Yeah, fuck it, just saying yeah. fuck it. Like, totally. like literally on their paychecks, they deduct like parking tickets because they're just like, I don't even care anymore. And yo, like, I don't think the city doesn't not notice this. You know what I mean? Yeah, I'm, I feel I'm like they're sure. ignoring it more and more. Like, like you said, like parking, uh, fire hydrants, I think they're just not giving tickets for this stuff a lot of the time now. But like there has to be some type of solution that they're thinking of that we don't know about. I don't know. I would, I would think, I would Adams think, is gonna be. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I would think they were. Uh, I feel like there can only be like two kinds of solutions to the mm -hmm. parking problem, which is essentially the too much car problem. And that's uh, either A, less cars on the road mm -hmm. either by like a legal means like mm -hmm. now it's illegal and or making it harder to get a car or be um 
fucking some crazy technological solution to parking. Like, you know those things that, like, like they stacking. park going up? Yep. Because if our buildings are going up and our roads are staying in one plane, then mm-hmm. it's never going to work ever. And it's only go- going to get worse. So, like, they have to do that somehow. Obviously, that's going to take a lot of money. Or, a lot of planning, yeah. Or, like, they another good option that should be an option regardless is making the MTA way better. Because... Okay, I can't complain compared to other cities. The fucking MT, uh, the MTA here is on point. Like, in comparison, I'm meaning... Well, I'm in not... comparison to, like, Atlanta, maybe, but not in comparison to, like, Paris. Well, Paris know? only has, like, I think it's 100-something stations. Mm-hmm. Whereas, like, New York has, like, over 300. And Paris is also, in comparison to New York, it's brand new. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And I think it spans way less, but... Uh, no, I mean, like, yeah, just Atlanta or, like, places in Massachusetts mm-hmm. or places in Connecticut. Like, their public transportation is really true. Yeah, it sucks, yeah. But, the, yeah, and, like, I think that a lot of people maybe who got a car, like, you wouldn't get a car if we had fucking magnetic bullet trains that get from Brooklyn to the Bronx in, in, in literal 10 minutes. Well, they're thinking about building, they've been talking about it for a while, but um, I think it's, like, a $2 billion project, and China will subsidize half of it because um, the person the the company that will construct it is from China but they want to build a bullet train from what is it from Baltimore to Philly to New York so that could kind of make those cities like commuter you know yeah commuter friendly yeah. to New York City like they could become more like outer boroughs yeah if that happened that, that could, would be that so could well. alleviate like you can get to Philadelphia in like 20 minutes you know yeah like you know people go, like you said <laughs> from Brooklyn to Queens an hour and a mm-hmm. half you yeah, could have really so much up. more, like, job opportunities, so much everything, you know what I mean? You could live in Baltimore and work in New York. If your commute is 20 minutes, yeah. in a way, it's, like, more realistic than, than here, do, yeah, what we're doing here. You know I mean? <laughs> yeah. but, um, Which is crazy to think. Yeah. What you were just saying about, like, you know, the MT getting their act together, I kind of think that the next, you know, downturn in New York City could be related to the subway just totally falling apart really i mean the subway is like the lifeline of the city it is and i mean the flooding that's been happening if there was something that was let's say twice as bad as uh sandy that could really do some significant damage to multiple lines and just i mean i can't Which imagine affects everything it would affect even like the global markets even like how if new york's uh was kind of if new york was put to a standstill Here, here's the, th- you know? the fucked up thing for me and i agree like 100 percent is like and that you could know, happen. It really could happen. You yeah, know? and it's Something probably going flooded. to because our weather is only getting crazier. Like, it's pretty much essentially a matter of time until it does happen, unless we plan accordingly starting now. But the thing is, like, for me, which I never understand, is like, okay, so let's say 6 million people. I looked it up once, but I don't remember the number, but I'm just making this oh, up. New York City, New York City yeah. is 9 million. No, no, I'm saying let's say oh. 6 million people swipe a day. Or oh, some okay. people swipe twice or whatever, yeah, yeah. but you end up swiping 6 million swipes a day and um, or whatever. And they make, or a second, like, so it's always some crazy shit. And then... It's over, like, a billion swipes a year. It's insanity. Like so that, then yeah. they make so much money, and, um... But what they're I always embezzling money and stuff. That's I what I don't now. understand. Like, where is their money going that they don't have the ability to improve this at a rapid speed? Because the technology is there. If they wanted to, the technology and the manpower, mm-hmm. it is there. Which means that either they simply don't have the money, which would be fucking insane, because then who the... Who Where has the, all this money been going? Who is the boss? Like, who is their financial advisor? Their financial advisor fucked up wicked hard if that wasn't enough money. Well, I mean, like, the 2nd Avenue subway just opened, but that's just, like, a parts of the 2nd Avenue subway that, that opened. The The idea behind the 2nd Avenue subway was, was much greater. And, like, the ribbon-cutting ceremony for that was with Rockefeller, you know, in the early 1900s, you know? So, um, like, where was all that money going that was supposed to, for the 2nd Avenue subway for, for, what is that, I don't know, 70 years? How many how many years was the Second Avenue subway just in flux, you know? And they, they always wrote it into the budget. And then where was that money going? So, so and, don't, and don't forget the bridges and tunnels because that's also MTA. You know the, what I mean? The so tolls. The tolls. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You're getting money from that every second. Every literally second. And it's yeah. more than two seventy five. I mean, there's definitely just all sorts of like corruption, corruption. and bureaucracy and whatnot. Yeah. And it's it's stupid to have that corruption there because, like you said, if something fucking goes wrong. Something goes really wrong for them too. Probably, they're probably just trying to ride it out as far as they can. Or I mean, they've been riding it long enough, you know. Yeah, and it's 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 really insane. I wish there could be something done. I wish there was like, you know, sometimes like uh, we've done like some like you know donation mm-hmm. campaigns to help out yep. like people within our community and also like different things like that. And often I find myself really trying to like sit and think about like what could actually like help not only my life 
but like everyone's life while also helping my life mm -hmm. like in a way like what what if i could like f help for example make the mta better mm -hmm. but it's like there's literally no fucking way you'd need like so much money and so much coercion and power and I'm like, well, that blows. So, you know what I mean? Like, I, it would be cool if a bunch of people could get together and make an actual change, like in this, like, so-called democracy. We all get together. We decide mm -hmm. this is what we want. Okay, we have this fucking fake online money. Boom, here you go. Mm -hmm. Now we fix it. And it's not possible because exactly. of the amount of money you I think need. There was that dude from um, London who came in to try to fix the subway system here in New York. And then I don't think he probably killed himself. I think he stopped working on it now. I think he just gave up on the. Maybe I'm wrong about that, but I think he's not even involved in the project anymore. Yeah. Cause it's like 1940s technology. Yeah. I'm just, in and I'm 2020. just, I'm just thinking about like the physical construction that you would have to do in mm -hmm. order to change and restructure like the subway system to like a bullet train. It would take so long. Like, oh, it would be impossible you know I mean? on this particular, you know, these tracks and whatnot. Yeah, you couldn't that's what do I'm that saying. Here, it yeah. would take forever, literally. You know what I mean? And yeah, so. and yeah, and they 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 would have to start, I guess, like maybe station by station. There would be a shit show. I mean, when they built it, I think it's 1904 was the original ribbon cutting ceremony. Yeah, 1904. They just didn't expect New York City to be this, the living, breathing organism that it yeah. is, you know? So um, I don't think anyone who was involved in the construction of it at yeah. that time realized, like, yeah. how much of a lifeline of the city it was really going to be. And now it's just so decrepit. Some stations yeah, are, like, 100%. so grimy, so decrepit, you know? Still standing on that original foundation that's mm -hmm. over a century old though yeah. there's like in a lot of stations if not most there's mm. legitimate like green slime oozing yeah, like from the real wall. nasty shit and yeah. there's no telling what that is yeah right like what the yeah. fuck is that there's like coag 100, 110 year old slime coagulated green slime that's turned into a prehistoric rock and you're breathing some particles in from yep. that shit all that steel dust and whatnot like, i wonder what it's like you know not even like workers but the guys who run those little like um newsstands on the mm -hmm. sub like uh, west fort street i know yeah, yeah. you know or 42nd street what it's like to breathe in that shit all day yeah. long have you ever had you know? any health concerns with being in the tunnel so long certainly yeah you have know, you ever gotten I mean, something checked out uh yeah i went for like a lung x-ray the other month i'm waiting for the results actually but um yeah it's something that as i've gotten older i am a bit um paranoid about you know mm -hmm. because i have had a decent i mean maybe not compared to workers but there's been just nights in my life coming out of the tunnels or just all sorts of you know just around the fumes and the filth and whatnot and just you know blowing out all sorts of multicolored snot out your nose and it's like what are the long-term effects of this neurologically or physically you know so do you wear any type of like ppe like mask and yeah stuff i wear like a mask um, whenever i paint anything indoors whether it's for a mural because i paint a lot of murals or if it's for um you know, painting in the tunnels. Yeah. But still, that can only protect so much because, like, so much of the absorption is really through your eyes or even in on, in your skin, you know, so... Yeah. Yeah. Like, it's seriously through your eyes. Yeah, that's, I think the eyes actually absorb as much, if not more, than, you know, your nose or mouth. In terms of what? Just like, gas particles? Uh, I mean, I'm no scientist, but, yeah, the particles, yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. we I talk, was having a conversation about this the other day with someone. Yeah. We talked to Sergio Hernandez, who's just, like, some tattooer guy, mm -hmm. and uh, he, he was saying how, like, COVID can be absorbed through the eyeballs. And I didn't really, like, pay, pay it that much thought when he said it, but now that you say that, it just reminds me of that. I mean, paint fumes, it makes sense if you, like, are in a tunnel. You see, when, when you spray near the lights, those mm -hmm. light bulbs, and you see the fumes... That shit's crazy, you know what I mean? It's really crazy, yeah. And when you don't see that, it's still there, obviously. It's, and even if you're not spraying, you just look at the, the light bulb. There's just, like, p dust particles just floating around yeah. and whatnot. So, um, yeah, I mean, the one saving grace maybe is that when you look at the older era of writers from the 80s, they were painting in the layups underground. They were painting with lead-based paint, you know, Rusto and whatnot. And a lot of those guys are still kicking, you know. A lot of those guys are still floating around. But, yeah, it's definitely a concern yeah. of mine, you know. Maybe yeah. it makes your immune system stronger. It's like that George Carlin I mean, skit where he was saying, like, he used to swim in the Hudson River when it was filled with uh, human shit. <laughs> <laughs> He's great. He's and one of my favorites. It's great. Yeah. Made him stronger, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, only time will tell. But, yeah. yes. I think, you'll, I think you'll be fine. Well, thank yeah. you very much. I like, I'm sure, I'm, like, maybe they're, like, maybe you're not as fine, let's say, as someone who didn't inhale, uh -huh. but everyone has inhaled some or done some something. Shit, like, yeah. th thinking about what we were saying in the beginning, like, there's literal, like, people who've been heroin addicts for 15 years who then end up living and being, like, healthy and iron men when they're 60. Mm -hmm. Or people who smoke for decades. Yeah, yeah, yeah A lot exactly. of it is genetics and whatnot, but yeah. um, 
still, I wish I had erred on the side of caution as a younger person, wearing a mask or when I was doing commission jobs, wearing a whole painter suit as opposed to just a mask, you know, yeah, so yeah. that kind of stuff. Well, a painter suit is just so that your skin doesn't absorb it? Yeah, I mean, it would just be good to not have all those particles floating around, you know, getting caught up in your hair and whatnot. Yeah. So. so, you know, um, in, in one of your pieces I saw, like, uh, that you wrote, like, the neurotic Jew mm-hmm. in, in one of your pieces. I didn't know. It wasn't in a piece. It, it was it a was full the piece. piece. Yeah, 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 it was the neurotic piece. Neurotic I think some toys fucking scribbled over that, but yeah. Yeah, and uh, I was just wondering what your what your ties are to your, like your, your your Jewish culture and your tradition because... I mean, certainly not... I'm not... I didn't grow up religious by any means. I mean, I wasn't even bar mitzvahed, but in terms of the... Uh, I mean, the name says it all, neurotic Jew, right? Right? So, um, in terms of maybe some, ele- some elements of my persona or... Um, Certainly, like, you're asking me how Judaism played a role in my life. Definitely culturally, like, in terms of just my grandparents, all the things they would talk about in terms of just um, uh, Jewish culture, Jewish heritage. But I'm not necessarily religious. But I definitely identify culturally with, with being Jewish. What are, some of the, what are some of the things culturally that you identify with? Other than being neurotic? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, just, uh, I would say... First and foremost, respect for the fact that so many people, so many Jews were murdered um, and so many Jews have been persecuted for hundreds of years and uh, thousands of years. And um, that uh, it's amazing that the Jewish people have been able to survive and persevere for, for all this time. And um, there's definitely something to that, you know? Yeah. So, no, like uh, I ask because... Um, you know, I, I read a pretty solid amount okay. and, um, one of the <clears throat> top, even since I was way younger, one of the topics that always like absolutely fascinated me was anytime it was something about, I've noticed it was just a general, like if it's about prison, but mainly like rights being stripped from you okay. as well as uh, severe fucking persecution, like crazy persecution. And, um, what like the, the ingenuities that motherfuckers will do when they're placed in it. Um, throughout different cultures, but specifically Jewish people, and um, you know, like uh, like s- f- some of the craziest, some of the most famous ones, like Mein Kampf or uh, Primo Levi's. Uh, if mm-hmm. this is a man, um, he also wrote like the Periodic Table, whatever, like a, the book, the Periodic Table, and um, or there's this one called like uh, I S- Survival in Auschwitz or uh, the Two Who Survived, whatever. There's a ton of them, and uh, when I read them, like I've never gotten tired of reading these stories they're all similar but they're all different and they're all fucking insane and it's like like you said it's like something to be said about uh the ability to like overcome such absolutely insane shit like uh um there is this one that i just read on on wikipedia Mm -hmm. it was a while ago but Mm -hmm. i read it on wikipedia and it was about uh I don't remember exactly the name, but it, it was something it translated to like the Jewish Combat Organization or the Jewish Combat League, and it was okay. a bunch of Jewish people who like the under like during the, yeah yeah war, like the Warsaw Warsaw ghetto yeah yeah yeah. Like that, yeah and then they like put them in the thing they put them in the ghetto mm-hmm. and these these Jewish people knew that they were going to get eliminated mm-hmm. and they started sneaking in weapons through fucking crazy methods through sewer like, systems yeah yeah uh, that was in Warsaw Poland. The Warsaw Ghetto. Uprising, yeah. And then, like, they started, or through, like, crazy trash cans. They had, like, different codes. And um, it's not as if, like, the Nazis weren't, fuck, they weren't fucking stupid. Like, they knew that, th- like I'm saying, they would assume that someone's going to try to, you know, they're looking out for everything. Mm-hmm. And still. Still, they were able to get, like, hundreds of guns down sne- there. Guns. And it wasn't just bombs. men. It was women, children. Yeah. Everyone was participating. And then. They almost all of them died. Yeah. You know? And then under the supervision of these mm-hmm. Nazi soldiers, they, like, the, the, the Jews would talk to themselves and they emptied out all the houses that were in the like in the entrance gate so when the nazis would come in the entrance gate they would like have those fucking rows of houses like with like soldier like the 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 jewish combat league Mm -hmm. inside so that they would light them up and it's just like fucking crazy like all the things they've done are um i was just reading one and he was talking about how in like in the gulag or in the prisons mm-hmm. they would uh re- they would oh, you mean the concentration camps or or in, well, like, no, the so so this was like this wasn't in a concentration camp okay. this was um someone who lived in Russia okay. and uh but it was like in super anti-semitic Russia and they were they were they were like spreading uh this person was like telling the other countries what was going on and they got sent to like a gulag okay. and um they but still, it's like someone under intense pressure and persecution. Mm-hmm. 
and they were ta- he would talk to his cellmate by taking his cup and taking all the water out of the toilet or some crazy shit and then like whispering into the toilet wow. like it was a toilet phone and then he somehow they because they were being watched like crazy and somehow they were able to hear each other and find out like okay i get it okay you initially talk but how do you initially get the person to understand to know that, this is that you need to toilet. empty out your water yeah and it's just like the insane shit that they've done and uh i've just always like found that like insanely fascinating um and it's something that like should be studied and learned from uh specifically like in primo levy's book if this is a man mm-hmm. um i'm not, are you familiar with that book no not so like it's, it's this is like a he was a, a, like an italian jew who got caught and uh trying to flee or he was part of like some law resistance mm-hmm. shit and they caught him long story short he ended up surviving like the entirety of like the 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 camp that he was in mm-hmm. which was like a while and uh, he did some crazy shit to survive and he wrote a book when he got out and uh, he titled it, If This Is a Man. He didn't title it Survival in Auschwitz, which is what the American title is. They changed okay. it because no one knows what If This Is a Man is going to be about. But if you see a book in Dick's, I mean, uh, in Barnes and Nobles that say that says uh, Survival in Auschwitz, you're going to buy it. Mm-hmm. As opposed to If This Is a Man, you might not know. So anyways, the, the, the book was called uh, If This Is a Man. And um, in the beginning, he has like this poem that he wrote. And he talks about like... Uh, he says, like, you who sleep comfortably, I'm, like, paraphrasing yeah, it, but he yeah. says, like, you who sleep comfortably, who get home to have a warm meal, you who, blah, 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 and then he says, like, consider if this is a man who fights for a scrap of bread, who does this, who does that, and also pretty much consider if, like, this is a man that, like, other humans are doing this to us. Mm-hmm. So this is, like, and this isn't the first time that this has happened, meaning not just to Jews, but to, in general, just, like, yeah, crazy world, fucking... Yeah totalitarian regimes that want to like whatever and um it's just something crazy because it like hasn't gone away there's a fucking like holocaust going on right now in like north korea or whatever Mm -hmm. and other places and we just it slips past our attention because we're living in our safe little america and uh i'm sure that in years to come meaning like probably like i'll be dead but they'll look back and be like look all these countries didn't do nothing but just like in, in just like in uh germany poland a lot of the countries didn't know what was happening and a lot of the countries, I mean, America knew what was happening and, yeah. and sent ships back, you know, from the port of New York even. Yeah. Um, so, um, but I mean, then you have, I think, the King of Denmark, when all the Jews had to wear a Star of David, the, the King of Denmark wore a star. And he said, every citizen of Denmark is a Jew. You know, so if the Nazis want to kill the Jews, they're going to have to come in and kill every citizen of Denmark. Yeah. You know, so there were people who, who stood up for situation and just to kind of like piggyback on what you're saying about the Warsaw ghetto uprising like a lot of um, non-Jews in Warsaw were helping get those guns into the ghettos and whatnot so there were people on the outside that were risking their lives to either shelter people like hide them you know in their crib if they were able to escape from the ghetto or get weapons into the ghetto to help fight the Nazis so really crazy shit you know and and it's something like it's also like what would you do like it's easy to say, oh, if this was happening now, that I would help. But, like, realistically, yeah, you might I don't just fucking know. put your head know. down and just kind of, like, go back to business. If, like, let's say, like, my, my next-door my next neighbors, let's say they're Polish, and I find out that the U.S. government's, like, really killing all Polish people. And uh, I know for a fact that I'm good money. Mm-hmm. But I also know for a fact that they're going to check my shit eventually. And if I hid they're my neighbors, kill you also. I'm getting killed, and my mom is getting killed, mm-hmm. and my dad is getting killed, and everybody's getting killed. And... I might come to the conclusion of like, well, seeing as no matter what, someone's getting killed, it might as well be one instead of three. And then I might, you know, um, use my judgment, I'm saying, to coerce myself into believing that what I'm doing is the moral decision because why have five people dead if you could have one? So the people who did help is fucking crazy. And they would get killed lickety split just like a Jew would get killed if they if they were yeah. caught like helping 100%. or housing the Jews. So yeah, it's um, it's really insane what human beings are capable of doing to one another with enough like you know? passion and willpower and like it's crazy to think like you said the people that would risk their everything they but had but it's also crazy on the flip side of that yeah. how horrible human beings could be to one another yes, like exactly or just like torturing other human beings like my uh my old girlfriend her grandmother uh survived auschwitz i believed wow and when her and her sister who all their all their relatives were killed so it was just her and her younger sister these girls must have been like 15 and 12 years old when they walked into the um, 
the uh, concentration, they were brought from one concentration camp to another. And then when they were brought from to the, the second one, they walked in and there were bodies pinned up on the barbed wire, just a, and with, with like opera music playing, like something out of a fucking horror movie. Yeah. Yeah. To let you know, like they would probably put them there to let the, the people coming in know that we don't give a fuck. Yeah, just, just, and we just will psychologically yeah, break yeah. them from day one, you know? That's what they say. They say that, like, a lot of that, uh, like, they, uh, I know, like, fr- from the readings that a lot of the people who survived um, make sure they kept their humanity mm-hmm. by doing small things such as, like, trying to wash your face, even mm-hmm. though you know it's, it's essentially, filthy, yeah. it's futile. Like, you're going to wash it, and it's going to get dirty, and no one even gives a fuck. Everyone here is the Everyone's dilapidated. filled, everyone's 20 pounds, yeah. Exactly, and, but the people who did, like, they tried to maintain that thing that makes you a human, that makes you clean things, and, like, um, kind of a little bit off topic, but one of the things I always think of is, like, materialism and how mm-hmm. it's seen as, like, a bad thing, and how, like, uh, it's, like, the stupid thing, I guess. Well, excess materialism. Excess materialism. Yeah. But some people, it, it is seen as uh, definitely, like, a lot of the times a praiseworthy thing mm-hmm. um, for those who are the farthest thing from materialistic like meaning like uh like like uh, a lot of like eastern religions like buddhism taoism mm-hmm. hinduism yeah you, they really stray from that and it's praised although but then, i never understood why the dalai lama has a gold a gold rolex watch <laughs> always does every he? every photo is wearing a rolex but yeah, anyway yeah yeah so then like I, I i look at it and um you know and then i read about i kind of put two and two together that are completely unrelated in a way and I read about the Jewish people who would strive mm-hmm. to have such materials because it keeps them human. Yeah, if you get your hands on a toothbrush or something, yeah. it meant that much there, or a comb. Yeah. Exactly, and it makes me think, like, mm, I don't know, maybe there's something to be said about that. Like, that is what it is to be human, to have fucking materials, like, mm-hmm. to care. In to, a a, deg- to, a d- to a degree, degree yeah, yeah, exactly. Excess, yeah. You know, it is. So, like, to shun it in totality, which is something, like, I've, like, made a resolution to do, like, in the past and then have, didn't, like, didn't follow through mm-hmm. with it. Um, it's like this doesn't make sense because if you were really stripped from all those things, then you'd be in somewhat of a similar situation that you wouldn't want to be in. You might, but if you strip yourself of all those things, you still might not be having your whole, you know, family and everyone you know murdered. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so no, there yeah, is a no, little more to factors. It. Yeah, but yeah. yeah there's <laughs> a lot of, there are a lot of other factors, but like in terms of survival, that just made me think of a crazy story. There's a family friend of mine whose grand, whose father was an older woman. Her father survived because he was a printer. So he had print, he had like the printing press in their town. And then Hitler wanted to flood um, Europe with various currencies to um, create crazy inflation to make all like the uh, non uh, the non allied countries poor, right? So he had this genius plan towards the end of the war to just print up all this money and then fly it over various countries and then just dump that money and then their money would be worthless. So this man, the night before he was supposed to be brought to the gas chamber, he was called to a special room and they gave him clothing, they started feeding him, and he started printing um, uh, counterfeit money. And there's a movie about it actually, wow. about these him and these three other guys who survived the Holocaust printing money. And people who survived, I think a lot of them had like a skill mm. like that. But yeah, it's and they true. probably just found out right in the nick of time. Yeah, just like okay, you're not going with these people to the showers. You're going to this other group, and they're like, okay, you know. But yeah, I mean, it's it's really crazy. But just to kind of come full circle, like, you know, to answer the question, the neurotic Jew piece is kind of like a funny, you know, a tip of the cap to Larry David or Woody yeah. Allen or whatever. But also, um, yeah, so I'm not like religious, but I definitely identify with it culturally. Yeah. You know? I mean, I've never been to Israel, you know, but yeah. D- does it trip you out thinking about all the stuff that was done to essentially uh, your people? Yeah, totally. And I mean, like, I, I read about this stuff of epigenetics, how like, um, you know, trauma can be passed from one uh, generation to the next. And it's like, well, maybe Jews are synonymous with being so neurotic because of the trauma f- over hundreds of years or thousands of years. So that's why, you know. Yeah, I mean, uh, that, that it, why wouldn't it be passed? I think, it, I think it, it would be, you know. Like they say, if you play even just music while baby's in the womb, well, I'm assuming, you know what I mean? Like it, it would make total sense mm-hmm. that it would be passed down. And especially like the, the ancestral stories, you know, passed down, like you would just naturally you would just hear like, like hear these things going mm-hmm. on, especially if you had someone in your family. Just so ingrained. Ge- and through generations going through that, you were like, oh shit, like that's connected to me. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So it only yeah. makes sense. He, he, he was telling me about how I in used restaurant, to work. Yeah. yeah. I, uh, after high school, I would uh, okay. work at a restaurant. It was like a kind of a Russian Soviet Union mm-hmm. kind of restaurant. Or like or? In Staten Island, actually. Oh, okay. And, um, 
I was just working there on the weekends to make a few like a little bit of money and sometimes I would see a lot of it would be a lot of older like war um people that like served in the military okay. in those times in those areas where the holocaust happened yep. and sometimes i would see oh tattoos yeah, tattoos sure, yeah. and that would just trip me out maybe not that at that age i was like 17 kind of just like whatever, whatever yeah. but like now looking back like i wish somehow i could just like pull up a chair and like listen to some type of story that they had because mm -hmm. it's just mind-boggling and it's sad to see that they might never ever have a voice of what happened you know what I mean? And they're conscious of that. Luckily, a lot of people wrote stories. A lot yeah. of people wrote stories, and a lot of people got it recorded by, like, mm. you know, like, the whatever, the Jewish organization of Holocaust Remembrance of XYZ City. So, like, there is a lot of actual audio, video footage on those people's stories. But, like, a lot of those guys mm. would try to scrub off the tattoos, and mm. other guys would be like, no, I'm going to keep this because I want to always remember, like, how fucked up this shit was. My grandfather is actually engraved. I have a certificate in the Holocaust Memorial in Washington, oh, wow. D.C., because he served in um, Russia during the world war ii and uh I'm, i don't know the full story mm -hmm. I, need to, I need to talk to my mom more about yeah. these things like i hate that you gotta like, find this out yo i hate that these things can just not be talked about but um he was apparently like a colonel in like some tank fleet and they saved like hundreds of jews and there was some type of like um confusion in what was happening it was just a very interesting story i just mm -hmm. w i wish i knew it right now to like say well, on this episode now, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah it's crazy why do you think uh even today, there's still uh, anti-Semitism. Because I, I personally, like, I don't understand it. Why people blame Jews for the world's problems? I don't know. I don't know, but it definitely is prevalent. I mean, I, heard, I was in the park the other day, and some guy on a bench was just, I couldn't really make out everything he was saying, but he was saying, no, the Jews, like, the Jews are doing this. I was like, all right, you know, if that's what you think. Yeah. Yeah. Have you had any experiences of you being... Um, I guess uh, singled out or treated negatively or no? No, no. Oh, actually, well, the only thing I can think of, um, like in 2010 or I think it was 2010, uh, a writer who goes by the name of Journey, him and myself, we went to Poland and we did all these Holocaust memorials through Stanford University. They had us go out there and like we did the Holocaust paintings with um, kids in um, who were from a local high school in this place, Lublin, Poland, and. Uh, they were all like these local soccer hooligan youth kids yeah. who were around there. And when they realized that what we were doing was like a Holocaust memorial, they destroyed it like right after we left. So wow. that was like something, you know, but that's the only time I could think of anything where I w encountered that, you know. It's so strange. Because like if you just break it down to the core of what's what you're doing and like just humanity in general, it's like... You know what I mean? It's like what? Why the division? Yeah, like we're all we're it's, all people. It's just you know, people and like that was just suffering and like we should understand what I don't know, just being human in a way, and like the division is crazy, like the stereotypes and all that stuff. Like, I don't what know. do you, what do you think? Uh, what what do you think we're at as like a society or like as humanity right now? Well, that's a very broad question, but I will say in terms of um, you, Amer for America. I have a lot of faith, maybe I'm, you know, a little idealistic, but I have faith in younger people, you know, people who are maybe, you know, 25 and, and under. Um, I think that they have, like, just a better um, worldview, at least just what I've encountered, you know, versus older generations or maybe people a little older than me. I don't want to put myself in that bracket quite, but um, I, I see, like, a lot less, we were just talking about barriers, I see a lot less barriers between young people, and maybe it's because of Instagram or the internet. You're good at this, I'm good at, let's just link up. Doesn't matter what our socioeconomic background is, we're just connected through this thing, we're gonna hate on each other less. I don't know, but I, I have a lot of faith in, and I think younger people are like, because um, I do like a lot of murals, I said, I do like a lot of workshops in schools, and like I think younger people are like super mature and whatnot these days. So um, I actually have faith in the future um, generations for this country but in terms of the world that's such like a crazy question yeah, because yeah. there's just so many fucking things going on and the world yeah, yeah. is so crazy yeah i definitely complex. in my mind i meant you know? it more of like the world we're living in, I well, guess, the world so we're living i have i oddly have faith but i think it's going to take like another 20 years to really get the ball rolling on a lot of that positivity mm. no it's very well put I, that's 
that's I agree and like I think even though despite everything going on right now it's important to have that mindset because that's the mindset that does make that happen you know what I mean like I, I often catch myself like dwelling in like the negatives of mm -hmm. what's going on you know what I mean but then like when I have an amazing day like laugh my ass off or like feel genuine happiness and love it's like Yo, life is not that bad. Life you know is not I mean? that bad. Yeah. So like most of the time. Yeah, so it's like sh when shit sucks. That's what sucks, I'm saying. Yeah. yeah, but you know, having a, a good optimistic view is a very important I think day in daily. Yeah, and I mean, that, listen, depression is on the rise. Um, I know at least like amongst girls, suicide and anxiety um, medication um, for like high school and college age girls is like through the roof right now. Maybe that is like a negative thing from Instagram or whatnot. Yeah. But I still have faith, even with these things, for younger people. So. Any any uh, closing remarks? Anything you want to say? Any shout outs you want to give? Any? Well, I was I was told I have to. I'm gonna give a shout out to my my boy Akobi from okay. Germany. That was very important <laughs> that I do that right now. Okay. G back crew, and uh, no, I think you guys are doing a great job on this show. I think it's really awesome. I appreciate you asking me to come on quite some time ago and just um, seeing the work you're putting in and the the way that you're trying to. Um, not only just to let other people have a voice, but also um, help people through your Patreon account. I think it's just incredible what you're doing. So I appreciate you having me. Awesome, yo, immense thank you, bro. It was an honor for us and an amazing talk. No, dude, thank, thank you, thank you awesome. so much. It was great to meet you. I've been looking up to your stuff for a while now. And so. it was cool to not just talk about graffiti. Oh, no, absolutely. Of course, man, that you was know? sick. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you, bro. Peace. All right. Jedi Five.